all fabric before the Lancashire mills was khadi. It was hand spun and hand woven. Now, the hand spinning is of two kinds. One is stuckly spinning. Now, you know, my first interest in khadi began actually in Missouri, where the, cat, where the goat herders would walk their goats, feed their goats, and they used to spin on a drop spindle. That tuckli was the birth of all khadi fabric, whether uh, wool, silk, or cotton. Then came the Kisan Charkha. The Kisan Charkha was, uh, Gandhiji was uh, a profound individual. He realized that if you use the Khadi, if you use the Kisan Charkha and spun yourself, only when an idea broke in your mind did the thread break. So it was a highly meditative exercise. His exercise was to do with meditation at a philosophical level. But at the more mundane and at the more equable level, it was to do with employment, never to do with quality. You see, we are a country which was a very poor country. And if you remember, uh, Pandiji, uh, Pandit Nehru wrote with this wonderful line, uh, the history of India may well be written with textiles as its leading motive. He was right. All the traders came to our shores because of cotton. In the process of the Kisan Charkha, it became meditative philosophically. So Gandhiji realized that how something was made was as important as what was made because it gave it that aspect of love, of care, of meditation, of seeking of God, of questioning, of introspection, of retrospection. And that's why he adopted Khadi. Because Khadi was a cry of freedom. Don't forget, it was the mills of India. It is extraordinary, our history, that the mills of India became the great backers of Gandhi. But they were the ones who were destroying the handloom and the Khadi industry, in a sense. I don't think they meant to, but it, it was the nature of Lakshmi, the nature of making money. And therefore, he emphasized village employment. It is the governments, all governments, past, present and future, will be responsible for the employment of their people. Not to do with fashion or quality or uh, surplus or uh, fine uh, rendering. It is not. The responsibility of government is to give its people food, employment, housing and clothing. And without um, Gandhiji's influence and without the setting up of institutions like the cottage industries, like the Khadi Village Industry Corporation, without the institutions of the handloom, uh, uh, the cottage industries uh, and uh, uh, HHEC and so on, I'm not so sure that it would have lasted. I think it would have gone the way it went in the rest of the world. We got saved because of the interventions of government at that time. The patronage of, of all this is uh, to be celebrated. Uh, the governments of India were to be celebrated for their thinking, uh, for their adoption of all these different institutions we now believe are. Uh, awful weights on our back, but at that time they were very, very important. It must be understood. You know, we have this propensity of blaming governments for this and that and the other. We seldom say, we seldom look back and say, oh my goodness, without their intervention, maybe, maybe none of this would have existed. Maybe it would have all have gone. Maybe village industries would have, which is what now, 25 to 30,000 crores would have gone the way of all things. When the refugees happened from Pakistan, how were they to be employed? What were the women going to be given to do? There was no work. They couldn't be agriculturists. Their husbands were agriculturists. They couldn't be traders. They didn't know how to sit in the shops. So she said, Embroidery, weaving, that became the that became Central Cottage Industries Corporation. It was Kamla Devi. <coughs> Pupul took it further. 
uh, by uh, the setting up the Handicrafts and Handwood Export Corporation. Because don't forget, by that time they began to believe, correctly, that there was a saturation point in India beyond which it was not going to travel. Therefore, it was necessary to export. Therefore, Popul went to Paris. You see, she had an appointment with um, Monsieur Salaron uh, and uh, Monsieur Cardin, were the two people who were very important uh, designers. And she had, uh, she was having lunch uh, in a wonderful restaurant uh, with Monsieur Cardin, and Salaron walked in and saw her having lunch with Cardin. Which is how Cardinal came to India, not Salaron. That's how it all evolved. So things happened by accident as well. Many, many years later, when there was the French festival in India, I invited Monsieur Salaron to come to India. And he said to me, I'll never forget, Je ferme la porte, I'm closing the door, but I will send everything. And he, Pierre Berger came with that great collection, which we showed at the Gateway of India and at the, at the Kuni Darwaza in Delhi. And all. It was quite a sensational. It was the single largest uh, fashion show ever. Khadi was something else. Khadi, uh, w because of its um, uh, ideological bias, had received a certain, should we say, sanctity. Now that uh, became, in a sense, a slight problem. Don't forget, the Gandhi cap became the uniform of India. Never forget going to Calcutta and met uh, Tagore, uh, Mr. Tagore. And Mr. Tagore had in his home Dhaka muslin. And it was like a souffle of beautiful fabric. But it, like, it was like clouds, it was so beautiful. And when I lifted it, it weighed absolutely nothing. It took my breath away. Then I began to look at Khadi. That Khadi was six to eight hundred counts. And then I began to look for it in the machine market. It was not available. It, it was, so my concern was really qualitative. It was to do with this souffle of beautiful, beautiful uh, cotton which is the main strength of India. Now, whether it is East Bengal or West Bengal isn't really the question. The question is that the Boshaks, who were the spinners of this yarn, were actually traders to Egypt, which is what Boshak means, in the ancient times. They then brought back with them all kinds of instrumentation. Uh, and uh, for instance, you know, there's that terrible myth of how the British are supposed to have cut off the fingers of... It's not true. You see, you see, it was to do with the nail. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to test how fine the yarn was, you may had a long nail on your thumb and into the nail you you punched holes and you drew the yarn out of those holes. So they were not allowed to keep the long nail, not the thumb. And I remember sitting in Calco Museum wondering how I was going to display all this fabric. This absolutely superb Dhaka Muslim, it was not possible. So we kept them in rolls and every week or 10 days I'd open a roll and feel it and I knew that this, there was nothing finer. Then, so the significance of Khadi was this. The other was that you see, only at the Calco Museum of Textiles did I realize that all fabric, whether it was painted or printed or ikat or brocade, or whatever, was all Khadi before the Lancashire Mills. Therefore, we had this profound knowledge of cotton. Uh, a slightly less profound knowledge of wool and uh, even less about silk, but we had it. And um, um, I then remember working with many designers in, in Europe, uh, Capuchin and so on, and, so, and in Japan. And the, the, the interest in Khadi began then. 
I tell you for the simple reason that one, khadi is not a is a non-slip fabric. Uh, it is an S twist. I'm being slightly technical. An S twist as opposed to a Z twist, which is all mill yarn. A Z twist. Now, of course, it's all changed because the Taiwanese now uh, can now imitate a Z twist and so on. So, forth. so life has changed. But uh, essentially, it was to do with the finesse of the cotton. The fineness of the cotton was determined by the short staple nature of it. The short staple nature of it was the strength of India. So all over the world, it was khadi. And then, more recently, in India. So khadi is a fabric of freedom. It was. It was. We forgot. Don't forget that on the 2nd of October every year, people wore Gandhi caps. To go on. Now they've abandoned them. But uh, it, it was a symbol of India. Uh, uh, Pandaji, the, 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 the most remarkable young Indian um, uh, leader and young prince, in a sense, wore the Gandhi cap. Uh, go with Balapan, name every leader, Maulana Tzad, they all wore the Gandhi cap. And then, slowly over a period of time, it became, it became to be less of a symbol. But that was the problem, I think. The problem was its... Um, uh, sanctification because that gave it a, a certain uh, uh, no, the cost began to be um, fudged and uh, not really looked at carefully enough I tell you one story in Ponduru um, there was a lady and she was spinning cotton on a Kisan Charka and I asked her how much money she got every day. And she said 25 rupees. Now, I was appalled because I said that if she got 25 rupees, if she was breaking stones on the side of a road, she would get 70 at that time. That was the minimum wage. So I said to her through a translator, but my, why do you spin? Why don't you break, forgive me, stones on the side of a road? She said, well, not only does it give me a meditative aspect to my life, but when my children see me spinning, they know I'm happy, they see the smile on my face. So it is the quality of life. And even though I can only eat two rotis and give my children two rotis each and a little rice maybe, that's good enough for me. Then I realized that the significance of, Gandhi, of, of Gandhi's idea was huge, the meditative quality of it. The, the, all these different uh, anecdotal uh, structures gave me my uh, passion for Khadi. The most, I think, the most important was uh, I suddenly realized that the one thing that every mother knows about a textile is that the most important aspect of a textile is its tactile quality. Now, we get carried away with colour. Uh, when I was doing an exhibition at the Royal College in London, Royal College of Art in London, I went to the director and I said, I wanted to do an exhibition for blind children. I was telling him yesterday. Blind children uh, are, ne are never invited to exhibitions. And I said to myself, well, why can't we get the London schools to give us, to send us blind children? And I took handloom cloth and hung it from a ceiling, 108 pieces. And <coughs> the directors were very upset and they said, no, but all the fabric will be destroyed. I said, it doesn't matter. We'll wash it and it'll be perfectly new. I promise you it won't cost more than 25,000 rupees. <coughs> so we did that exhibition. And you know, only four pieces were stained. That's the Khadi exhibition happened because when I came back to India, Andreas Reinhardt, wonderful gentleman, said to me, "What are the two aspects of textiles that you don't, that you have not studied at all?" And I said to him, it "Was Khadi and carpets?" And his reply was, "What can you do in three years?" Uh, Khadi or carpets, and I said, let's do Khadi. But even then, the principle was 
that the Kadi would be for blind children. Now, uh, I had a team. Nobody does works on their own. I'll show you. It has to be a team effort. Uh, one learns from the young and from the old, and new significances are given by young, uh, by, by the young. And I learned a lot. And I'll never forget doing this exhibition at the IGNC in Delhi. And the fabric, if you remember, was on rollers. You were very involved. And um, the reason why I had rollers was because I felt that if, if it got stained, then we just roll it off. And, and uh, you know, I didn't have, it was there for about three weeks. I didn't have to change except for two rollers. That's the only ones I changed. And the, the children came. Shobhita had organized children from schools of Delhi, blind children. And a child came and the teacher brought the child to me and says, this child wants to meet you, uncle. And I said, oh, have you, have you enjoyed feeling the fabric? And you see, you see, the blind children was extraordinary. You see, when they loved the fabric, they'd hold it to their cheeks. And this child said to me, oh, uncle, this feels like the wings of a dragonfly. I had never heard anything so beautiful about the textile in my life. This feels like the wings of a dragonfly. I was so overwhelmed, I walked out of the exhibition, uh, having uh, held the child, and I said to the principal of that school, but when do children feel the wings of a dragonfly? And what she said to me was, that you know their touch is so gentle, that when they feel even skin or the wings of a butterfly, the pigmentation of that butterfly wing never goes because they feel it so softly. That's when I decided that I had to abandon textiles because it was uh, something I had learned from this young child which I could never replicate. And for me, I suddenly realized that all my life I'd been searching for uh, the, the sanctity of the fabric in terms of sight, in terms of smell, in terms of taste, in terms of, but not really its tactile quality. And this child, this little, little boy, explained to me the great tactile nature of our fabric. My first intervention was handlooms, because don't forget, uh, Pupul, when the Festival of India happened in England, uh, Pupal said, you go and do a textile exhibition of your choice. I said, I'll show her, I'll be able to do it. When I traveled through India, there was nothing left. There was no konyas, there were no satrangas, there was no uh, kochneel for ikat, there was no machni patnam hand painting, none of it existed because the patronage had failed, which is why we need it again, uh, which is why I celebrate what you're doing. You see, I, but I had the Weaver Service Center, some brilliant minds. Don't forget, the great artists of India were all, nearly all, employed by the Weaver Service Center, Popol, because she realized that K.J. Subramaniam, you do understand that things like cotton cut work didn't exist in India. They were created by Mr. K.G. Subramaniam, the great painter. He created a cotton cut work in Banaras because he had to give employment to hundreds of weavers. So he created, the, the, so there was Gautam Vagra, J.K. Redaya, Sunil Das, Amba Das. Um, all these great painters were all employed at the weavers. So I said to them, by turn, we must do something in your area. Please help me. I do not know what to do. And, and that's how the first Vishwakarma appeared. The first Vishwakarma for me was a revelation, as it was for everybody, because nobody knew it existed. I'll never forget people like Mrs. Gandhi, who was a great patroness. She's coming and, uh, to that exhibition in, at the, at the, at, at the Ravindra Bhavan. And uh, when she walked in, uh, she took a deep breath because she had never seen trees of life so tall. Each tree of life had 1,500 blocks. I mean, that, was, that is the genius of India. 
But to put it together, of course, it took a lot of passion, a little knowledge, a lot of passion, and a vast teamwork, which is what we need again. Because you see, you see, the world is now searching for something else. The world, I think, is looking for organic subjects. Whether it be organic food or organic clothing or, or um, aspects of our organic housing, they, it, it, they suddenly realize that climate change is, a, is an issue that is not going to go away. When the first Vishwakarma happened, the response was unbelievable. I'll never forget at Rabindra Bhavan, um, um, we had a sales counter on the third floor. And Mrs. Gandhi came up and she said, oh, that's a very pretty sari. And began to draw it towards her. And another lady, without looking at her, said, it's mine. And drew it. And then she saw that it was Mrs. Gandhi. She nearly fainted. Then she said, madam, you can have it. So Mrs. Gandhi very graciously said, no, it's for you. You, you saw it first. Do you know we sold 8 lakh rupees in 3 hours? That's when I realized that we were on to a wonderful thing. The, the handlooms. And it took off. Then I did Vishwakarma 2 and Vishwakarma 3. Then the last Vishwakarma was art in public places. And do you know that the patron was the World Bank? Because you, they have the most fantastic commissions of uh, that uh, we were involved with uh, of the life of the the story of the weaver horses uh, 108 different horses in um, in all the colors you can possibly imagine you had, but you see i then realized that i was not in business i was in development and one of the problem and the only reason i was not the only reason, was that the weavers would only trust me if I was not in the business of it. I had no financial motive, so everything was for them. And then I realized that governments, by definition, have a tenure. And when a, when a government fades out and a new government comes in, there's a change in perception, perspective. That was very difficult. Vishwakarma actually began to collapse under its own weight. By that I mean, we were dealing with, I think, 280 centers in India. I was not in business. Uh, there were a lot of people who made a lot of money, good for them. But the point is that it was not possible for me to sustain. So I handed it over to a lot of young people, uh, including Rita, who has Amar Bhastra Prosh, Razi, and so on. So for a lot, a lot of people, lots of people. Lots of people got very interested and did a lot of work. And, but then I realized that, you know, any intervention has a certain life of its own. When it's over, it is over. You have to wait for the next call to come, for the next passionate gentleman or lady to take it over. That has been taking a little time and it's coming. But it is going to happen, I'm sure. Uh, however, it couldn't happen on a national perception perspective because there was nobody like Pupil Jacker to, to be the puppeteer. The fineness of the cloth, it is too fine for contemporary usage. That is the one problem. Who wants a 400 count cloth to do what? With, as a pochette or a handkerchief? <coughs> you cannot make a kurta, it is too transparent. That was one perception. The other is we began to devaluate itself because we began to cheat. Don't forget we are at one level a nation of traders. And as traders, we began to um, mix the yarns, use mill warps with khadi wefts, uh, to tell a number of lies to a number of people. Uh, for instance, the most, amongst the most spectacular khadi cloth that I know, is the robes of the justices of the courts. The black robes are always, were, always in airy silk, hand spun and hand woven. It is part vana, which is a fabric which is made without twisting the weft. So it is smooth. It is non-slip. 
it was a spectacular fabric. Then the courts changed their idea and said they could wear polyester and finished. But that is inev inevitable. You see, you see, Prasad, you, the, everybody is in search of a new fiber. And their new fibers have come. I mentioned, I began this uh, whole uh, discussion by uh, suggesting that, you know, uh, yarn is the byproduct of food or energy. Cotton is the by byproduct of cotton seed oil. Uh, cotton seed oil was terribly, imp terribly important because it creates less soot. So the mashals were always with cotton seed oil. Just as silk is the um, is, uh, is as a result of um, protein, the silk worm. Don't forget that the Chinese emperors were always buried with a jade silk worm at the base of their head. These are the they, just take uh, polyester is a byproduct of petroleum. Nylon is a byproduct of coal. They're all byproducts of energy or food. And uh, some years ago, when I was really interested, um, uh, there was an international uh, 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 council uh, for textiles. And they asked me what I thought was going to be the new fiber. And you know what I think it is? I think it will be. It's kelp. And you know, there's the Japanese University of Osaka, this I'm talking about the 80s, who had documented 650 kinds of kelp, of, of seaweed, and uh, they were making yarns out of it. Now, the reason why I mention this is that finally, we will have to have a new fiber. Cotton is not going to be able to be sustained. When we have that new fiber, whether it can be machine woven or hand woven, Hand spun or machine spun is another matter. But now let's change the perception of Gandhi. From cotton to wool. Don't forget, most Pashmina shawls are hand spun and hand loom. But most wool in India of that quality is hand spun and hand woven. Why don't we do that? Let's take airy silk. By definition, if the moth is allowed to escape the cocoon, which is why it's called a hinsak silk, Gandhiji called it a hinsak silk, but because it's called a hinsak silk by the Buddha. The, 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 the Buddhist monks of, um, East, of Western Arunachal Pradesh wear it during the month of Magh, which is January. And i give you one clue. The god... The shivling is dressed with an airy fabric in the month of Mark, always, even today. It is a hinsak, it, is, it has a higher thermohygrograph than mulberry silk. By that I mean it contains more water, it is more heatening than any other silk that we know. You do understand that six to eight times is the quantity of airy silk above mulberry silk. Now it's no longer hand spun because now uh, it is possible to um, machine spin it. And, but we have silk. Right, right. Now the, the new silk, by the way, is going to be Attica silk from South, uh, South Africa, which is going to revolutionize silk, but that's another whole matter. But we have four silks. We have mulberry, we have tassa, we have eri, and we have muga. Everybody's forgotten about Muga, but Muga is the most wonderful golden silk available in the world. Um, so, even let's take cotton. We have short staple, medium staple, long staple, and super long staple. The super long staple is called Tamil. Tamil is the longest filament of cotton fiber. It's longer than Sea Island cotton. Now, how many people know? I tell you why I have a suspicion that you see possibly what cotton fiber was used for before it was made into cloth was for the making of wicks for diyas. That is what its use was. Therefore, with <laughs> now with the use of polyester, etc., somehow it's faded from the um, 
reverberance of memory, the reverberance of how women used to use these wicks, make them at home, pluck the cotton, make the wicks, and so on. This is an aside, but I think it's an important thing because I, I think that perceptions change. Uh, and every generation has a perception. I myself now wear uh, wool, which is hand spun and hand woven. I wear cotton khadi kurtas. But when I'm relaxing on my own, in the, I wear polyester. I'm not so sure that the new generation will not just wear microfibers and polyester. Easier to wash, easier to dry, easier to clean, easier to wear, easier to move on a train and a bus with it. To begin with, I believe that Abraham and Tucker is unique because they have a fashion designer with the textile designer as a combination. I know of no other design company that has that. And many, many years ago, Antonio Ratti once said to me, he said, you see, the difference is this. Antonio Ratti was the supplier to the world of fabrics, especially of silk. This is to Salon, to Cardin, to and then name it, to Calvin Klein, to Oscar de la Renta, to Bill Blass. Everybody was supplied by him, but he remained anonymous. Because he said, there's only one person who can get the credit for it, and that's the fashion designer. Now, in the case of Abraham and Thakur, a very fine fashion designer is working with the finest woven textile designer that this country has. That's their perception. And don't forget, Rakesh's perception is hand looms. It has always been. You know, I tell you, when I first met him in the 80s, it was for the following reason. I was traveling in Andhra Pradesh. Whenever I went to a village in Andhra Pradesh, there had been somebody who'd been there before me, this man called Rakesh Thakur. Who is this young man? Who is he? I get back to Ahmedabad. I was working at the Calico Museum and I ring up Ashok Chatterjee. I said, you have a student called Rakesh Thakur? He said, yes, we have. I said, I'd like to meet him. And Razi came and showed me the ikat he was doing from Puttapaka. And I realized that I was looking at genius. And that's how Issey Miyaki took him on. I mean, what fantastic work that gentleman has done in, 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 in woven textiles. Inc unbelievable. Unbelievable. In the simplicity, you see, his reinvention of the ikat process as a sphere, circle, triangle, square and straight line revolutionized ikat. Doubly cut as a sphere. I mean, Ise put it on the cover of his book. It was on the cover of the Time magazine. And Ise Miyaki said, this is a tribute to India and to Rakesh Thakur. Now, when you get that combination with uh, David uh, uh, Abraham's sensibilities of fashion, it's unique. However, they are fighting a battle which I think is a difficult one. <coughs> they have nothing really for the bridal. B b bridal, I'm told, I don't understand fashion, no, nor am I involved, is the big, big um, uh, fashion statement of India. Now, if you're not in uh, bridal, there's a problem, isn't there? But they have stuck to their uh, uh, principled belief in handlooms, and that's why they do such incredible work. Their sarees of Maheshwar are really to perish for. You see, I've always felt that the older you grow, uh, perceptions change, you, there's a certain tiredness that enters into the scope of your design. In this case, however, there's a certain newness that has entered. For instance, he did a sari uh, recently, a year or two year, years ago, where each pleat was a different color. My God, it was a perception that I had, we have seen saris like that before but not of the colors that he had. They were like the colors of a pale peacock. I mean, his ikat sari, with that, at the VNA, with that, oh my God, I mean, where do you get that yellow with the black? I mean, against that poppy, unbelievable. A warp length of hand looms is 12 meters. In a machine, is 50,000 meters. 
That is the constraint of any hand process. By definition, the quality is much finer, but the quantity is much less. Therefore, when we talk about the global perceptions, there is a problem. The problem is of scale. How can you equate a 12 um, meter fabric length with a 50,000 meter fabric length? It's not possible. Now, there's something else is happening though. You know, <coughs> uh, people need new things now more and more. Uh, when uh, in the old mills, when the 50,000 meters had to be divided up, I'm making it simplistic, uh, they'd lose about 10 meters in the changeover from one design to another. Now it's been reduced to one meter. It's become 250 meters per warp length of a particular design. That's the difference. The, you see, Khadi is even less. Now, if you, if you wish to promote Khadi as a global fabric, it has to be done within the constraints, if I may say so, of comfort luxury. It has to be at that level. It cannot be uh, at, at a mass level. It is not possible. It's not possible. It's not possible. Nor should it be possible. However, that is not the abiding principle of a government. A government must ensure employment. Absolutely, but then you have to change the perception. The perception should not only be cotton, it should be silk and wool. If you changed it from into cotton, silk and wool together, you could do it. So that's very possible. It is possible. But you see, who is going to do it? The, 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 my view is this, as a, as, a, as, a, as a submission. My submission is that this is not the responsibility of government. It cannot be. It should be the responsibility of corporates. For instance, Mr. Kumar Lamangrambilla has in a number of airports set up these, uh, I think they're called Gandhi um, Khadi, Gandhi's Khadi or some such thing. Uh, they're rather nice shops. They're, they're not too expensive. They, they have a statue of Gandhi. Uh, it is a perception that is, that is happy to see. But now, if he were to promote Khadi, then it's possible that it could be done. But it needs a perception of time and of scale. By that I mean the scale must be lower, the perception of time must be longer. It needs not a three-year perspective or a five-year perspective. I would say a seven to nine-year perspective. You see, the, the background exists. Take this Khadi book which is a huge team effort, 108 pieces of khadi lie in this book. From the fine to the very thick. So it all exists here. You do understand, for instance, that the national flag of India had to be in khadi. It was made in Karnataka in a village. I go to that village and I look at this fabric and I realize two things. That the fabric of the flag was different to the binding for the flag. Do you get my meaning? Because the binding of the flag had to be thicker than the fabric itself. Now, all the national flags of India had to be in Khadi. That was patronage. It got abandoned. It's not polyester and nylon. But when I see uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, tricolor flying above Connaught Place in the polyester and nylon, it is beautiful. It has, it has the wind in it. It carries the message far across. When, as therefore, there are certain things which uh, change in perception, which are better than they were earlier. Now, what happens to that khadi that was that village? I've always wondered, which had produced the khadi for the national flags. This, is, this was a, a team effort. It's a, it's a wonderful perception of khadi. Because not only do you get this luminosity, but you get, by just looking at it, its finesse, by looking at it through light. So, this is the finest, and the whole description of who made it, what its, um, uh, what its uh, 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 weave is, and who made it, it's all in the book. My idea was that anybody who bought it, could or saw it, 
If they like the fabric by feeling it, by looking at it, by smelling it, <coughs> could actually order it from where it was made. It has done rather well. And now this is the patronage of, an, of a Swiss gentleman called Andreas Reinhardt. If Andreas Reinhardt had not given the uh, uh, patronage, I would never have been able to do it. It was not to do with government. This is what I talk about patronage of India. We need to do exhibitions of these fabrics. This, all these fabrics are without color. Because my view was that khadis, the strength of khadi is this in its tactile quality, nothing else. The, the finesse, the, um, the, uh, the, the crudeness of the weave gave it an elemental, organic process which was incredible. You could dye it in any color you like. You could print it, you could weave it, you could cut it, you could do whatever you liked with it. But essentially, essentially it's to do with texture. Essentially it's to do with the mother wrapping a child in a swaddling cloth, which had to be soft. It's a comfort level textile. That's why this was done. There's some, uh, the, the, you know, <laughs> I look at it in wonder, because this is, you can only do with love, passion and love. And the precision with which it is done is the precision of textiles. Let me suggest one thing to you. You see, if a, if a warp sits against a weft at 90 degrees, it is a perfect textile. It is the language of precision. It is from here, from the, from the song of the cashmere carpet weaver, that we have the computer. Because zero is the warp, one is the weft. Without zero and one, you would not have had the jacquard. Without the jacquard, you would not have had the computer. How many people understand that today? The binary mathematics system begins with textiles. Zero for the warp. One for the weft, sitting at right angles, perfectly precise, gave rise to the jacquard. The jacquard then gave rise to the computer. The title of the exhibition that we did in the 2000s was called The Fabric of Freedom. Because Gandhiji understood many, many years ago that traders came to our shores, as I mentioned earlier, because of textiles. The setting up of the mills, the creation of Watson's volumes, the Lancashire mills, the Manchester spinning mills, all as a result of Indian technology. And therefore, his great emphasis was self-employment with the meditative quality where there was pride in manufacture, and so khadi. Now, in my terms, it was a genius of an idea because it was so simple. Everybody understood it. Don't forget the fashionable ladies of India by then were wearing chiffon. And he then said, why not wear khadi? And a lot of ladies began to wear khadi. Sherwanis were made of brocades. <coughs> they became khadi. One thing I've always found strange, that the Indian nightwear, quote unquote, is usually khadi, oh, it's kurta pajama. In the day, people wear trousers and shirts. And at night, Switch to, is that not historical? Because the comfort level is in the pajama kurta. Why can't that be worn during the day? If you have that with a slab yarn or a yarn or a fabric which has, um, in a sense, more holes in it than not, it is more comfortable because it breathes more than any other fabric. Therefore, Khadi, uh, Gandhiji understood all this. Essentially. 
But he got involved with employment. And so he commissioned the Ambar Charkha. Now the problem of the Ambar Charkha is that whereas the philosophical base of the meditative quality of hand spinning was his byword. With the introduction of the Ambar Charkha, which could be uh, powered by um, a fan point. Uh, in fact, I remember going to the Sabarmati Ashram and seeing all these Ambar Charkhas being made in the 70s and 80s, powered, uh, which were tested by um, electricity. And I go then on a journey to uh, a different occasion to Navdweep, where they used to make wonderful khadi. And Lord, in front of me were eight spindles being, uh, machines of eight spindles each being run by electricity. Uh, now, when he, uh, he did that because of the need for employment. So from the qualitative nature of khadi, it changed to the need for a mechanism which gave self-employment to people with pride. And that is the, unfortunately for me, because I have a different perception. My concern was not employment. My concern was qualitative um, by definition, because by the time we came on the scene, um, machine textiles had flowered into the most magnificent of all things. Uh, um, uh, 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 we all wore machine fabrics. And then I go to Ahmedabad and I work in the Calico Museum and suddenly I began to understand that khadi was a fabric of comfort. But only later did I understand that, that khadi was the fabric of our freedom. That is the difference in the perception. <coughs> in 2015, I think that it won't be the employment that matters as much as the comfort level. If we can convince, because it is the truth, that a khadi fabric is more comfortable than a machine textile. If we can uh, understand that ourselves and in a limited quantity promote that in the world, we will be, 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 be doing a great service to both Khadi and to the world. It is by the Shia, like take this fabric, it's, it, it is Khadi. It is uh, Kashmir Khadi, hand spun, hand woven Khadi. It is uh, wool, uh, silk, cotton. All these can be done in the Khadi process. Uh, which is hand spun and hand woven, whether it be Ambar Charkha or the other is a matter of uh, chance. But you see, there are many, many problems. You see, Prashad, for instance, the Taiwanese have now produced a machine that does the S twist with slubbed yarn. And you look at it, and you cannot differentiate between Khadi and this fabric. Now, I do not know, because I have, uh, unfortunately, I do not have the capacity of understanding whether it is as comfortable as khadi, that I do not know. But uh, it looks, you go to a uh, HP thing in Delhi or whatever, and you ask for khadi, and they give you this fabric, and you look at it, and you wonder whether it is really, because it has a glaze, uh, it looks like a machine fabric, which is with the, the hand quality to it. It is uh, possibly, possibly, Taiwanese yarn being woven by a machine imitating khadi. Now, if that happens for too long, then there's a problem. If I remember correctly, the Khadi Village Industries Corporation, when it existed, village industries itself was 18 to 20,000 crores. Khadi was only eight to 800 to 900 crores at that time. Now, it just shows the difference in perception. The reason for Khadi being promoted as it was, was the sanctity given to it by Gandhiji. I don't think Khadi was the key. The key was handlooms. And I'll never forget that when Mrs. Kennedy first came, she was amongst the first people 
to buy a full length kurta made of Kashmir tabby silk with chicken work. And she bought it, I think, to wear at the beach. But don't forget that the greatest influence was of the Beatles. When the Beatles arrive in Rishikesh, they revolutionize two things. One is the wearing of the kurta, and the other is the wearing of the Rudraksh beads. They are wholly responsible for that genre of influence. Extraordinary. India came onto the map again, fashion-wise. Not because of Diana Breland, who is the greatest lady of fashion, nor Mrs. Onassis, who is a great fashion icon, but because of the Beatles. And, and, and uh, 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 strangely enough, uh, amongst my earliest recollections of, of the Beatles is, uh, the, the, I'll even remember the date, 6th of April of that year was the opening of Tabela. And Psychedeli, which is the company that my friends and I had launched for fashion, was opened on that same day. And we had a fashion show at the Tabela. And who should be there but um, Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney? No. They... Uh, shocking pink is the navy blue of India. Uh, it's Dinah Breeland's comment, but they made it possible. Don't forget, when I was a young man in college, we used to wear black trousers and a white shirt. We then changed to shocking pink kurtas and acid green trousers and so on and so forth. The color of India is white. The color of Rajasthan is the peacock. I see two perceptions. One is of color, because we are the master dyers to the world. Never forget that. Our appreciation of color in this country, because possibly of the sun, because possibly we have six different climatic uh, uh, weather patterns, possibly because we look at color so differently. One is the perception of color. The other is the perception of comfort. If I may suggest you, take the Kantha tradition. The Kanthas were dhotis, six layers, that were quilted together to make a swaddling cloth for a child. Now, what could be more comfortable than that? When used dhotis were made, quilted together and used for children. If you put together comfort with color, you have a, the beginning of a product which is invincible. However, we are limited by the qualitative nature of it. It cannot be quantifiable. It cannot go into millions and millions of uh, shopping malls of the Europe and America and the rest of the world. It has to be limited to a few. And therefore, the prices have to go up. Let me suggest something. When we began the Vishwakarma experiment, I was convinced, as I am convinced today, that things of quality will have to be paid for. And is it not extraordinary that I walk into a Taj shop and I see an Ikat Sari selling for 5 lakhs of rupees. And in my time, in 1980, 15,000 rupees was too much. And I look now, 5 lakhs? Chota Lal Sarvi can sell a sari for five lakh. That is what we need. We need not millions, but hundreds of thousands of these products that will sell for a requisite price because finally the man who makes must be compensated for what he makes with the correct value. Because don't forget that that, that cycle is a strange cycle. From the cotton grower to the cotton retailer. One of the people who wanted to have a great influence on this was Mr. Kurian of Amul. He had me once on a board where we discussed the 
cotton growers being the retailers of that fabric. Now, what a brilliant idea. However, the problem was this, that whereas milk is a perishable product, cotton is not. Therefore, the hoarding of cotton could be done by private people much more than by the cotton grower because the cotton grower needed the money to buy food. That is the problem. Many years ago, there is a scholar called Peter Andrews. Peter Andrews is the scholar of tents of the world. He has written two volumes on Persian tents and he has done one on Indian tents. He's now 84. And he took me on a, uh, on a visit to villages between Jodhpur and Jasalmer, which were goat hair and camel hair weaving villages. All dyed indigo. And he said to me that these are the tents of the Tuaregs of Morocco. Would you believe it? And do you know that at that time, this was in the 70s, the average export to the Sudan and to Morocco and Algeria was 15 to 20 crores, all from this area. Now, earlier than this, the great textile for me was Sanganer prints because uh, I had the good fortune of working on the Jai, uh, Jai Gar Trust and so on with um, uh, Maharaja Bhavani Singh. And what a collection they had of Sanganer prints. And I go to Sanganer and there's a man called Jain. And on his wall, there was a, a frame in which there were 18 textiles one inch square and I look at them and they were all resist fabrics which means that the flowers were in white with the colored ground and I said oh my god where are these from they said this is the great strength of Sangana I then fell in love with Rajasthan and textiles so there were two aspects one was the camel and goat hair weaving that were made into the Tuareg tents. The other was the Prince of Rajasthan, Sanganer, um, Bar uh, Bar Barmer. I mean, you cannot imagine what Barmer prints were like. You just cannot imagine the animal imagery on the Barmer prints. It's now, unfortunately, no longer there. But I mean, it, 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 it can be revived. It can be revived. And uh, in Pipar, and Balotra, they had vats for indigo dyeing. And they had these um, prints for the ghagras of the ladies, which were with Qatar designs. Qatar is that old uh, um, uh, 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 forked dagger. Uh, because the woman, the lady, had to be protected. And she was protected by what she wore, which was the Qatar. Now, when I saw all this, I said, oh my God. Then I looked at Dari weaving. It is great, the Dari weaving of Rajasthan. Uh, next to Andhra Pradesh, it is really quite uh, extraordinary. And then, Leheria and Bandhani. These are the great te technologies of Rajasthan with Gujarat. Of course, the greatest Bandhani is Kutch. But the greatest Leheria is Rajasthan. Now, let me suggest one thing to you. Look how Rajasthan has affected the fashion industry of the world. You do understand that the, the turban with the tail was invented by Sir P, who is the regent of Jodhpur, because when he got onto a horse, the tail had to be the length of his Bangala coat, which was also invented in Rajasthan. The Jodhpur, Jodhpaws was also invented in Rajasthan. This is for the men. I've given you three examples. The Jodhpur, 
the bangala coat and the pag with the tail. Take the ladies. Ghagras were below the knee. And what were they called? They were called saras. Below the knee, the royal ladies had anklets, nine, from below the knee to the, uh, to the foot. <coughs> Henley's book, great. Now, suddenly, the, the, all the ghagras of India are ankle length. It comes from Rajasthan. The Orni, the Orni, you do understand that the, it's very strange. But when you look at the Orni today, 45 inches and 18 inches make up the Orni. There's a stitch in the middle, not in the middle, on one side. Why? Because they didn't have 16 inch fabric. But don't forget that that is because of chiffon. Because in cotton, they used to put these wonderful um, 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 gota on the cloth. Gota is a tradition of Rajasthan. Now, there are so many traditions in Rajasthan, uh, but essentially not a fine cotton weaving. No silk and very crude wool. But the finest Khadi village bhandar is in Jasalmer, I assure you. Because I don't know whether you know that um, there's a community where black and white shawls all come made on khadi, looms, ambar charka. And they're worn in Pakistan and in India by this one community, all from there. Pink and green, you may have remembered. They are camel, uh, camel herders who wear a pink and green, all from Jasalmer, all from that shop. It's, you see, Rajasthan is, is supremely rich in, whereas the India, a color of India is white, the white of the August moon, the white of the clouds when the rain is spent, the white of the jasmine flower, the white of the conch shell, and the white of the August moon. The colors of Rajasthan are colors. And Kota Doria, what do you think of that? Kota Doria was a fabric made for turbans because it was so light. Now, if you go to the Calico Museum of Texas or to the VNA in London, you find these absolutely exquisite Leheria turbans on Kota Doria, which makes them even more iridescent. Kota Doria, by definition, is a fabric that is light that was woven on 9-inch looms, 22 meters long, for pags. That is the traditional use of Kota Doria. I've worked on Kota Doria, not substantially, but quite a lot. I could never understand one thing. Why Chanderi wasn't more popular than the Kota Doria? Because don't forget, that's another subject altogether, but silk and cotton together makes a much lighter fabric than Kota Doria. So Kota Doria is something that was, I can't remember the name of the lady who has really promoted and done a fab fabulous job uh, of Kota Doria. I remember uh, as a younger person uh, in the summer, the, one of the travel saris from Kapusa to Masuri was Kota Doria printed. But by then, the turbans were less worn. But essentially, Kota Doria is a turban fabric, that I assure you. But, you know, um, it is the additive to the textile that gives Rajasthan its pe peculiar quality today. Uh, the use of gota, uh, the reinvention of gota in, uh, by Mr. Sharma and uh, uh, people of that kind is unbelievable. You used to go to the shop outside the city palace and you look at his 
treasure trove and he says they are 18th and 19th century texts they are all made today. So there is quality. And only if you are sort of interested and um, will he tell you that they are made today. But there, there is a great wealth. Take Dari weaving. You do understand that the finest Dari weaving in this country is Ten's reverse twist yarn from Warangal in Andhra. The second best is Jodhpur and Barmer. It has to be an intervention, not an interference. It is so rich in this cultural heritage that you just have to extract from it and make it possibly simpler. Take their bandhani patterns. Possibly it is too patterned. Possibly it needs to be made simpler. Take their sanghanair prints. The work that people like Brigitte Singh have done has been remarkable. She returned to Sanganer the simplicity of form. Don't forget the ancient, the medieval angochas of Sanganer were unidirectional and with one flower. When I look at the confusion of florals, in uh, Sanghanair today, it confuses me. Amongst the greatest resources for Sanghanair is in the Textile Museum in Washington, where on a single spread, there are 1,800 different Sanghanair patterns. We need to make it simpler. But they are pioneers in Rajasthan. Take the work done by Anoki. It is pioneering in the effort. Do you know that the young Rachel makes books today with fabrics in them, which they sell? I looked at them, she very kindly gave me some copies, in total astonishment, because that is the quality we need. We need books which have the actual fabrics in them, which demonstrate that you can touch it, you can see it, you can smell it. It, you can do everything you like, but it has the actual fabric in it. Whether it be Anoki, whether it be um, Fab India, whether it be people like Brigitte Singh, whether it be Toy and Joy, whether it be the creation of tents of Rajasthan, they are, whether it's um, the Jaipur Razai, whether it is the Kashto, which is called the Dora, Oh, I can't remember the name. They are all inventions. Whether it is the garden umbrella of these are all great um, uh, introductions to Rajasthan. Therefore, my only submission is that I hope the designers do not reinvent the wheel. They need to extract from what they see. For instance, I have never seen a great but great butterfly print from Rajasthan. I do not see why not. Um, I've never seen a great dragonfly. I have seen some animals, but not great. But when you think of the poppy flower, and when you think of that wonderful velvet mansing tent of Rajasthan, when you think of the Lal Dera tent of Jodhpur, uh, the the world has acknowledged it. It's time that we acknowledge them today and reinterpret them in today's form.